Welcome to the Rotary Club of Edina. I'm your host, Josh Sprague, our president of the number one club in the universe. Woo. I'd like to extend a special welcome to all the guests, friends, and visiting Rotarians Zooming with us today. Before we get started, I just wanted to remind you of a few best practices to make this a more productive and enjoyable Zoom call. First, mute your audio during presentations. Rename yourself in the participants list. We will be taking attendance today. We screenshot the participants, so we just need to be able to identify you by name. You can change your name by just hovering over your video square in the top right corner. There's the three dot menu. Click the menu and hit rename. Use the chat function today for questions and comments. Uh, as the speaker is sharing today, you can put your questions in there and we'll take them in order of submission. And then last, please be aware this meeting is being recorded for posterity. So that? the future of the Rotary Club of Edina is bright. Although we are working through some of the most challenging circumstances in our club's history, we have two very creative and determined boards that are finding solutions and moving our club forward. This includes our five officers that are in constant communications and chatter about the future direction of the club, including past president John Flynn, secretary Joe Hayes, treasurer Michael Stanzak, and your president-elect Sam Thompson. Adding to this superlative leadership group is our new officer, Shelley Loberg, who is rolling off the club board after three years as international service chair. Shelley is an absolutely rock solid leader and a rock solid human being. And I can't wait to work alongside her in the new Rotary year. In the meantime, let's hear what Shelley has to say about this year's presidential theme, Rotary Connects the World. And just so you know, this is our last video in the series. And so as always, Shelley gets the last word. I think Rotary Connects the World fits my committee perfectly because it really, you know, we do a lot of great things here locally and those are the things that are easier to see and to hear about. But, you know, Rotary is a worldwide organization and really does connect us to hundreds of other cultures and lots of people from different backgrounds and you know when i went to guatemala and met the rotarians there it's like yeah like these are my people you know they're doing the same thing that we are doing you know in their country and the ability to connect with another club and get something done that really improves people's lives is that's super motivating Awesome. And now I'd like to thank today's volunteers who helped make this meeting possible and invite Jean Morrison to lead us in the invocation, Pledge of Allegiance and four-way test. Jean. The tragic and unnecessary death of George Floyd reminds us that our lives are lived well when they are lived in service to each other. We have no greater purpose than a commitment to be good to each other to be good to ourselves and through those acts to create a just world. Let us commit to kindness, commit to justice, commit to community. We share our lives with those around us and throughout the world, and we are enriched immeasurably by the relationships we form, the experiences we have, and the justice that we can create. I offer this Franciscan blessing. May God bless you with a restless discomfort about easy answers, half-truths, and superficial relationships so that you may seek truth boldly and love deep within your heart. May God bless you with holy anger at injustice, oppression, and exploitation of people so that you may tirelessly work for justice, freedom, and peace among all people. May God bless you with the gift of 
tears to shed for those who suffer from pain, rejection, starvation, or the loss of all they cherish, so that they may reach out, so that you may reach out your hand to comfort them and transform their pain into joy. And may God bless you with enough foolishness and fortitude to believe that you really can make a difference in this world so that you are able with God's grace to do what others claim cannot be done. Awesome. Okay. The Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance, pledge allegiance to the flag, the flag of the United States of America, States of America and to the Republic for which it stands one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And as Rotarians of the things we think, say, and do, is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendships? And will it be beneficial to all concerned? Thanks, Jean. Okay, on to announcements, Renee Harberts. You've got an announcement. Yes. So, guys, sad to say, this is our last um, social committee event for the year and my last one as your social director. So, sorry to be leaving you, but happy to be ending with this particular social event. It is next Thursday, June 18th. Guys, sign up today if you're interested. We are very fortunate to have... Allison Perrier, who is a level two sommelier. And she's going to be teaching us about um, three wines that we're going to have. We're going to have a rosé, an organic rosé, a uh, Sauvignon Blanc, and then a Zin, which um, she said she got us a great deal on. And the Zin pairs really well with everything on the grill for the summer. So they're particularly chosen for the summer. She is doing this education for us free of charge because she loves Rotarians. If you were to pay, she would, you would probably pay $100 for her education. So please go to our event, sign up. The only cost is just the cost of the three um, bottles of wine. The address right there is for you to go to pick it up. It's in Bloomington. If you go, you can either do curbside or go in. Just tell them that you're there to pick up the rotary uh, wines. They will have it all ready, along with a little sheet about the wines. Then um, she will be sending out, we'll be sending out a Zoom invite to everybody who signed up. And that's really all you need is three glasses. Um, oh, I think you cut out, Renee. We look forward to this last event. This is an example of the creative and determined board leaders I mentioned in my introduction. This is gonna be an awesome event. Thank you, Renee, for your career creativity on this one. Okay, Susan Stiles, TRF. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, here I am giving you another update on our campaign and also recognizing some individuals uh, we're getting down to the end here, and I know that everyone's participating. Uh, we've been getting uh, individuals stepping up right through the end of this month. Almost every day I see some contributions come in, so that's really exciting. Um, our uh, overall, we're over 125000 now. Um, our annual fund is a little short of what the uh, district would like. They wanted to see about 100000 but our polio campaign is actually higher than it's been in previous years. So um, please give what you can and what you're comfortable with and hopefully we'll get close to 100% participation. So I want to recognize our major donors this afternoon. This is different than the way we typically recognize our major donors and um, but we've got a number of them that just became new major donors this year. And I want to recognize all of them before our fiscal year ends. Um, achieving major donor status is a big thing. It really represents a significant commitment to um, our international club's mission and purpose. 
Um, oftentimes, we see major donors have been members for a long time. Remember, it's uh, you get there with cumulative giving, um, and we want to honorably recognize the members within our club that have achieved that level. Um, we do um, want would like these donors, if they would like, um, as we start to meet in person, if they could just share some thoughts or insights with our club like we've had previous major donors do. And uh, this summer I will be reaching out to them. If we end up continuing with these virtual style meetings, then we'll give them um, a Zoom platform to share their thoughts and insights about um, giving to Rotary International and being a major donor. So major donor level one is cumulative gifts of 10,000 and more. Major donor level two is cumulative gifts of 25,000 and more. And Josh, if you go to the next slide, recognizing um, Charlie Bear, Jennifer Benarant, um, Hannah Lohr, Brooker, Sam Cote, Dr. Sita Dash, John Flynn, Les Jones, and Tim Murphy. And um, I just want to give you a heartfelt thank you for all that you do and the way you represent our club in Edina. We do, compared to clubs around the world, we have a lot of major donors and it just is another reflection of how um, how gracious our members are and and how grateful we all are for what we have. So thank you, everybody. Thanks, Susan. And let's uh, remember Stevie Ray told us this is the applause sign in, uh, in sign language. Let's all do this for our major donors since we can't stand up today. Congratulations, everybody. Thank you so much for your commitment to the mission of Rotary International Humanitarian Mission. Uh, it's great to see uh, all of these people step up, uh, including our two level two donors, past uh, district governor and past president Tim Murphy and Dr. Hanelore Bruker. Thank you again. Okay, a quick uh, few notes on member services. As mentioned before, you, you can make uh, your attendance makeups via watching YouTube videos and emailing Becky, our administrator. So Chuck, you may have missed a few meetings, but you can check them all out online. All you got to do is go to our Rotary Club of Adina YouTube page. If you Google um, Adina Rotary YouTube, you'll come up on this channel. You can see uh, here's a brand new video this week. Uh, past President Jennifer Benarat um, edited this past president's timeline. It's been updated through this year. Check that out. Um, also, Renee Harbert's Rotary Connect the World video from last week. And then, of course, our Zoom meetings and our Rotary TV studio meetings as well. Also, we're rolling out a new text notification service for meetings. If you haven't done this, text Rotary to 22452. You're going to love this service. In addition to those emails telling you what's for lunch and who the speaker is, You'll get that text on your phone too, and you might see it faster, especially if you're traveling to and from other locations. Again, all you do is text Rotary to 22452. And then last, uh, our Rotary International Convention was canceled in Hawaii. Uh, it's where I would be right now with Sam Thompson and some others. But uh, instead of the actual in-person convention, they are offering a virtual convention if you're interested, there are a lot of really interesting breakout sessions. All you have to do is go to riconvention.org and June 20th to 26th, you'll be able to jump into the live stream of President Mark Maloney's introductory speech and the opening session and a lot of other things. And if you've never been to a convention, this is an easy way to spectate um, and check it out. And now we have the last classification talk of the year from none other than Ryan Wilson. Ryan, take it away. Hi everybody, Ryan Wilson here. Um, I joined Rotary in May of 2019. Uh, my club sponsor was Royce Pavoka and my classification is business banker. Um, like most bankers today, I did not grow up thinking I wanted to be a banker. In fact, I didn't even like playing the banker game in Monopoly. Um, I was born and raised in South 
East Michigan. So like most other kids in Detroit, I always pictured myself as an engineer or working in the automotive supply chain like my parents. I was learning Japanese in school, so I guess my specific dream would have been to uh, work for Mazda, Nissan, or maybe even Honda. Um, I must have been about 16 years old and working on my clunker of a car with my dad when I realized that a career in automotive engineering was probably not the right choice for me. I went to school at Eastern Michigan University, home of the Eagles, um, to study international business, finance, and Japanese. Um, you could be forgiven for not recognizing the name Eastern Michigan University if you're not from the state. Um, Eastern is rival schools with Western Michigan, which some of you may recognize for its connection to PJ Fleck. After college, I worked for a Japanese freight forwarder for a few years, a competitor to C.H. Robinson. Um, that job never really felt like the right fit for me, so that's when I fell into banking, and I'm glad I did. Um, I started my career in banking at Comerica Bank in Detroit in 2014 and have been working in the industry ever since. I met my wife while I was in college. Um, I was in Osaka, Japan studying business and she was at the same Japanese college studying Asian history. Um, my wife's family is all in Minnesota and that's how I landed here. Um, my wife and I love to travel and up on the screen you see a photo of the two of us on a recent trip to uh, visit a friend in Belgium. Um, we've been married for three years now. Um, last December, we celebrated the birth of our daughter, Leona. Um, she's a very smiley and talkative six-month-old. Um, no words yet, of course, but that doesn't stop her from trying. And here's a photo of her sporting the rotary blue and yellow. Her favorite activity is snuggling with mom and dad, so that's how we spend most of our time these days. Last year, we bought our first home in Shoreview. Um, when I'm out with Leona, I can usually be found working on a home improvement project. Isn't it crazy how you complete one home project and two more take its place on the to-do list? Uh, I lived in Minnesota for four years now and have worked at Tradition Capital Bank as a business banker that entire time. Our office is on France Avenue in Edina and at Tradition, I'm responsible for helping our business clients with their financing and cash management needs and managing the credit approval process. I work with a wide variety of businesses. Um, they include manufacturers and distributors, contractors, uh, service and retail, and real estate investors and developers. Um, I enjoy problem solving, so helping my clients figure out a creative loan solution is my favorite part of the job. Um, the Rotary Club motto, service above self, is really what drew me to considering membership. I like how Rotary members are focused on giving back to the community and improving the world we live in. Um, I want to be a part of that, and I'm proud to be a Rotarian. Um, I've met many of you um, already over the, my first year here in the Rotary Club of Edina. Um, I look forward to getting to know all of you better over the years to come. I can't wait to see you all in person again next month, and thank you for listening to my story. Thank you so much, Ryan. Great job. And I just am so impressed. Uh, you know, one of the things uh, you did early on was you were a sponsor for our Gala Capital Bank was a very significant sponsor. Tradition Mortgage was a, a very significant sponsor as well. And we appreciate you buying into this humanitarian mission and supporting what we do both locally and around the world. It's a pleasure to have you in the club, Ryan. Okay, and now it's my pleasure to introduce Paul Moody who will bring us today's program. Paul joined the club in April of 1999 and was sponsored by Bob Hildreth. Paul's classification is manufacturing and he is the owner and chairman of Faribault Woolen Mill, tied with Cargill for the oldest manufacturing business in the state, which he resurrected from closure in 2011. Under Paul's leadership, the 150 year old brand has been fully revived and the manufacturer facility brought back to life and full employment. Paul was president of our club the year I joined during the 2008-2009 Rotary year when the international theme was Make Dreams Real. Paul is a major donor to the Rotary Foundation, a major donor to the Edina Rotary Foundation, and always extremely engaged in our programs and projects. Paul is also a perennial, perennial helper on the speaker committee and has helped to bring many high quality speakers to our club from his many connections in the business community, at the University of Minnesota, and at the Carlson School of Management. 
Paul lives in Edina with his wife, Jean, and they have three adult children, Missy, 33, Michael, 29, and Allie, 25. They also have two grandchildren, Cameron and Blake, and one more grandchild, a granddaughter, on the way and due any day now. Please help me welcome my friend and fellow Rotarian, Paul Moody. I take myself off uh, mute there. Thank you, Josh. Um, very kind. Uh, I'm, I'm really pleased today to to bring uh, have us uh, hear from uh, Rand Park. We're having a uh, Rand Park, who's a senior lecturer uh, in the Department of Strategic Planning and Entrepreneurship at the Carlson School of Management at the University of Minnesota. Um, and the subject today is on ethics, business ethics, which you know certainly is near and dear to all of our hearts. And um, you know, it's, I think it's timely anytime, but uh, maybe particularly right now. Uh, since 1997, he's taught ethics courses at Hamlin University, the University of Minnesota College of, of Continuing Education, and Carlson School of Management. He's held a variety of professional positions over the past 20 years, including law, public finance, higher education, administration, and fundraising and development. From 97 to 2002, he served on the board of directors of Health Partners, he currently serves on the Twin Cities Community Advisory Council of Minnesota Public Radio. And in 2019, he joined the board of directors of the Better Business Bureau Foundation of Minnesota in North Dakota. He's a PhD from the University of Minnesota, yay. Uh, a JD from uh, the Hamlin University School of Law and a BA and MA from the University of Georgia. Obviously a really smart guy. He, uh, he's held an NASD Series 7 and 63 licenses and remains a member of the Minnesota Bar in good standing. With that, please welcome our speaker today, Rand Park. All right, thank you very much, Paul. Uh, and Josh, I can share my screen. Um, yep, uh, go ahead. Okay, uh, I think somebody else is sharing. So, oh, there we go, all right. All right, so thank you guys so much uh, for having me here today. I. Uh, when Josh and uh, Paul and I were talking before, my thought was um, I would talk about uh, the shift in corporate governance from a shareholder focused model to a stakeholder focused model and some other things. But um, uh, given the global pandemic and some of the other things, I, I talked to Josh a couple of weeks ago and I said, you know, I think there's some really interesting ethical questions around uh, where we're going with reopening the economy. And so um, that's where I'm going to talk today. I'm going to use the uh, framework approach that we use in our ethics classes at Carlson um, and hopefully give you guys some food for thought and also maybe some strategies around uh, for all of you with your businesses about how we're going to emerge um, hopefully into a, a once again robust economy. Um, now in the media uh, as we read one of the things that we keep seeing uh, is this sort of standoff between the epidemiologists and the economists. Uh, it seems, it, it almost seems like there's been a, a battle lines have been drawn uh, that, that uh, the epidemiologists, the Mike Osterholms of the world, the, the Fauci's are looking at uh, human lives, exposure, disease, with an end goal of sort of protecting as many individuals as possible. Uh, at the same time, the business community has uh, responded and said, you know, we can't, we can't shut everything down. Uh, the economy, uh, people's lives and sustenance, supporting their families, growing their businesses, uh, keeping all of our retirement plans solvent uh, really needs uh, people to be engaged in business, which is, uh, and, and it seems like we've been put in a sort of uh, almost uh, unsolvable dilemma between the two. If you think about the messaging, um, you know, we've heard on the one side, flatten the curve, save lives, protect those who are the most vulnerable. Um, but, you know, if you look at it from the perspective of an economist, you would say, well, nothing's really ever perfect. Um, there are often trade-offs. Uh, we all balance risk and reward. Um, can we think about, you know, how are we going to proceed from here? And I, my, my thought and the way I would talk about this with my students is uh, we really need to back away from this sort of zero sum game and think about it more uh, in terms of the stakeholders involved, the people involved, and how can we uh, thoughtfully and reflectively uh, work together to come up with what we need to do. Now, in the classes I teach at Carlson, both undergrad and MBA, 
um, we use what's called a stage theory of moral development and some key ethical approaches that are part of the sort of business ethics curriculum at many universities. Um, and so these are not original ideas with me. Uh, these are uh, things that I have found useful. Um, and I think looking at taking these approaches and using a stakeholder analysis will help us. Uh, now we're gonna have some very specific examples toward the end. And I know along the way, uh, you guys may have some questions. Um, this is uh, the questions that you have, if you put them in the chat, uh, Josh will be able to at, ask those questions when I get toward the end of my uh, presentation here today. Um, Lawrence Kohlberg uh, created this stage theory of moral development as a way of helping us categorize the reasons that we give for why something is the right thing to do. And I find this to be very useful and I usually spend a couple of weeks on this, but it really is common sense. And I think that you guys can understand if I just walk through it pretty quickly that uh, when we think about the right thing to do, the most simple basic way we think about it is, am I avoiding punishment? When you think about you know, why you stop at a stop sign. Um, most of us don't stop at stop signs with a grand appreciation for civil engineering and traffic flow. It's like, I don't wanna get a ticket. Um, and in that circumstance, right, avoiding punishment is a sufficient level of sort of moral reasoning. Now we also, you know, from a selfish perspective, we also might decide something's the right thing to do because we get something out of the deal, right? Should I engage in this activity? Will I get a reward from it? Now those are very basic level and not really where we wanna be when it starts talking about really important ethical concerns. Now, Kohlberg would call that pre-conventional. The conventional way of deciding what to do, you know, what's everybody else doing? Um, if you think about, uh, I use, I've often used Volkswagen as an example when they got busted a couple of years ago for their clean diesel, uh, you know, manipulating the emission software in their vehicles uh, so that they could fit into California's restrictive emissions laws. Um, and one of the very first things the CEO, the then CEO of Volkswagen said when presented with this was, all car companies do this. Everybody does this. Everybody games the system. Well, you can imagine how that, how the reaction was. There's also following the law in a very strict sense. Now, if you think about it, these are the kind of things where we would say, you know, 50% capacity to, you know, very, very um, black letter law. Um, and again, this is a way of make, deciding what the right thing is to do, but this doesn't really take into account individuals other than yourself and the greater community. The post-conventional ethical approaches, and this is where we want to be, is the social contract, right? So both from a utility perspective and a justice perspective, when we look at large groups of people, how do we situate our decision and our strategy within the greater society? And then, of course, we get to the universal ethical principle, and this, uh, in plain language, is the golden rule. Um, are there, can you take your action and consider it as an action that you would also be willing to accept yourself? And um, when we get to that, we get to some uh, pretty difficult decisions. But again, uh, we want to be here. Now, those first two, the pre-conventional, you're only looking at yourself. And I think we can all agree that, that just selfishly deciding what's good for me is not necessarily always the best for society. And just doing what the people around you do without having any kind of extra analytical approach, again, uh, I, I don't think this is going to give us the kind of answers we want. We want to take into account all of the stakeholders that are affected by our actions. Um, and this is where we wanna be. So setting that up, let's think about what are some of the approaches and the model that we use. Um, it's URJC, and I'm gonna talk about them quickly here. Utility, rights, justice, and care. Now utility is gonna line up, if you think about it, with the economists. Right. This is measuring outcomes in terms of uh, we're going we're gonna to do the, the thing that creates the greatest overall good, the greatest overall benefit to society in terms of the economy, in terms of people's ability to achieve happiness. Um, now, the challenge is you kind of can have some winners and losers here. Uh, I, I remember when um, the Southwest Light Rail finally got approved and Mayor Betsy Hodges was talking about the people who live in the Kenilworth Corridor between Lake of the Isles and Cedar Lake. And she said, you know, I know that it's going to be kind of difficult for those, but the greater good demands that we find a way for Southwest Light Rail to move forward. Um, 
this is the this is participatory democracy this is you know we, we are we're comfortable many of us in terms of business and politics will saying who's got the most votes who's getting the most benefit and that's going to decide right action the challenge though is that sometimes those actions can impinge upon our freedom to choose upon our human dignity and especially when we start talking about uh, intentional deception or coercion um, you know you may be end up you may end up saying, oh, this is the greatest way to approach this problem. But if let's say, for example, there are some health and safety regulations that you probably should be following, but it's kind of expensive to do so. And you know that, and you know that your employees may or may not be aware of those safety issues, that violates human dignity. And so we would say, you know, these kind of run in, and this human dignity and the rights piece is a little bit more where the epidemiologists and the people who are concerned about people with COVID-19 are landing that no one should lose their life to COVID if it can be prevented. Um, but, you know, do we wrap everybody up in a bubble and not have any commerce? Then we, you know, again, somewhat at odds. The, the benefit to having a model that has more than this is the justice and care perspectives, because they give us a place where we can negotiate and have some uh, understanding of uh, balancing benefits and burdens. So the justice approach is about due process and fairness, setting rules up at the beginning so that we don't judge success by winners and losers, but by whether or not the process itself was fair. I have a lot of student athletes at the U. And so it's, it's I can say, you know, let's think about basketball, for example. You've got the out of bounds lines, you've got the three point line, foul line, you've got uh, any number of, of rules about, and then once the rules are set, the teams compete. And somebody wins and somebody loses every time. Um, but if you lost fair and square, you would say, okay, I had a shot. I, it was fair, even though maybe I didn't win the game, I felt like I had a, a fair chance to, to demonstrate my behavior. Now, utility, rights, and justice are all fairly logical, fairly driven by either rules or measurements. But there are times when we need to think about relationships. And so the final piece of this model. Uh, takes into account valuing relationships and trust. And there are going to be times when a analytical application of the rules don't cover the fact that there are some people that matter more to us, some long-term family relationships, business relationships, et cetera. And if we're gonna have community and trust, there may be times when we say, okay, I have a long-term employee, he or she has used up their sick leave, uh, you know, normal rules and fairness would say that all employees are the same, but maybe this employee's circumstances, relationships, et cetera, are different enough that we would say the ethic of care requires that we maybe make a different decision. Now, none of these really is sufficient in and of itself. What we try to do with our students is say, don't stop with one. Go through and ask yourself those questions. Now, when I got this uh, speaking engagement and I, I I didn't, I had heard about the four-way test, but I started to do a little reading and I was really impressed. The story of Herbert Taylor and taking over the club aluminum company in 1932 when it was in bankruptcy and realizing that the code of ethics that they had was so long that it was not useful and, and coming up with those four questions. And I started thinking about the model I just described to you and those four questions and they really are, they actually kind of line up. Um, so when you tell you, you know, is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill? Will it be beneficial? Truth is all about rights. And, you know, when we say truth, that sounds really good. But if you flip it and you say, what if somebody's telling you a lie? We lie to people because we want to get them to do something maybe they wouldn't otherwise do. So we want to respect that choice. Fairness, again, very straightforward. Goodwill and friendships is rooted in that ethic of care. And then when we think about benefits, we're not thinking about those selfish benefits. We're thinking about the benefits of overall society to all concerned. And so, you know, I'm, I'm gonna borrow the four-way test for my class <laughs> because I think this is a really great uh, summary of exactly the same concepts that some of the moral philosophers and business ethics people have talked about. Now, one thing that people trip on sometimes is stakeholder analysis. They start here, owners, employees, customers, and they don't think about the fact that over time, you know, other stakeholders are impinged, impacted, and we want to be careful when we make decisions that we don't just stop at that first circle and say, okay, owners, et cetera. We need to think about the greater good of society because sometimes our actions go beyond that. I'll give you a quick example. 
Back in 2015, McCormick decided to swap out all the four ounce cans of pepper with three ounce cans of pepper, same size can, same price, same spot on the shelf, no other notice. Right, so I bring my can of pepper to class and talk about this with my students. Nobody knew. Now, were they lying? No. Did it seem like there might be a little deception going on because they didn't really tell anybody? And how carefully are you going to look when you're running down the aisle at Costco or Target and you grab this off the shelf? Now, slack fill packaging, right, is opaque packaging that has air, right? And so it happens with a lot of products. The size of the container is not the same as the amount of product that's in the container. Turns out there are some rules around this. Um, and if we think about it from our perspectives, we can actually go in and say, okay, owners and employees and customers, is, is it a good business decision for McCormick to sell the same, uh, to, to sell 25% less product for the same price? They're gonna make a lot more money. And from a utility perspective, does it really hurt the customer? It doesn't. But think about it from a rights perspective. If, you are, if it starts to seem like you're intentionally trying to trick your customers, you start to erode the very most important thing that consumer brands have, which is trust. And if you're lying about this or acting a little sketchy, what else are you maybe lying about? So this is something that's very important to think about. It turns out it was Watkins company in Red Wing that actually noticed this was happening. They said, you know, 25% is too much. You're violating the Deceptive Trade Practices Act. They filed a federal lawsuit and it all ended up on the front page of the Wall Street Journal. So I think going back, probably not the kind of decision if you'd thought about the long game. Now here's the challenge. This is gonna be the case with coronavirus. And I've, I've got my Star Tribune here. My students, I'm in my mid fifties. I still get the, the print newspaper. My students always make fun of me because I take pictures of the newspaper and put it on my PowerPoint slides. But um, when I saw this on June 4th, I thought this, this is helpful. I um, mean, I'll talk about it pretty quickly here, but Names that you know, right? Broders, Revival, Rustica, um, during the takeout phase, now this is pre prior to Wednesday's opening up, started to have employees who were testing positive for COVID. And the question came, do you let your customers know that that's why you have to shut down your operations? Because look, I've put it in the red box here, there's no legal requirement, right? You're not required to do so, but why would you want to deal with that? And there were some great quotes in this article, you can probably go back and find it yourself, but right? You don't want to make your clientele feel like they're, you're being in danger, you're endangering them, right? It's a serious deal, um, right? How do we deal with this? How do we do what's safest for employees, for the general public, right? Owners, employees, customers, the stakeholders are somewhat the same. And if you think about it, if you have somebody who maybe that's young and healthy and they get this, they may not have serious health problems, but they may take it home to somebody who's older, who does have health problems, right? The, the, the circles of stakeholders get larger, and it's something that we want to be thinking about. Um, once again, the, the owner of Revival talked about this, asked some of these really key questions, right? Do you close completely? Does the public have a right to know? Uh, do we quarantine staffers? All right, no real clear answer. We're on the front edge. Nobody knows what to do or how to navigate it. Now, what I would suggest to you guys, any business owner, is take the time to think through this, and I'll say something to you. I'll I tell my students this, and I probably heard this along the way. It's not original to me, but I always tell them, don't be in a hurry to make a bad decision, right? We've got some time. Nobody knows where this thing is going. But if we go back and think about the stage theory I talked about before, um, just looking at short-term profits or just doing what everyone else is doing or following minimal requirements, I don't think is enough, right? I think we need to be thinking about the social contract, ethical principles, and considering those stakeholders, taking the time to think about the longer term and greater impacts of some of the decisions that we're making, maybe when it comes to safety protocols, when it comes to delivery, when it comes to how we're gonna configure our office spaces. Um, I just got an email from my dentist about what's gonna be happening at the dentist when I go, and I'm gonna be sitting in my car until they call me. And you know, I mean, there's a lot of things that people are having to think about. And you guys have the benefit of already having this four-way test sort of embedded, but think about it, right? Trust and transparency. Are you respecting the rights and human dignity of the people, the customers, their families, uh, the greater society with what you're doing, right? Hiding, deceiving, uh, being embarrassed about something and not telling really could have bad impact, right? Balancing those bisques, 
benefits, risks, and burdens in a fair, uh, transparent way where people understand what's going on. Valuing those relationships, right? We're not disinterested strangers. This is not some physics test where we're all like billiard balls and vector. I mean, we have relationships and we have to understand those. And then finally, those long-term sustainability, greater good kind of benefits versus the short term. Um, and I think this uh, gives us a set of questions and a set of perspectives so that in, in all our various forms of businesses that we have, we can start to say, okay, what's next? Here's a sort of thoughtful analytical way to approach this. Um, and I think, uh, you know, we, we see it playing out. I think the, the example of these restaurants is one that's very helpful because it's, like you said, it's the front edge, but it gives us hopefully some food for thought as we move forward. So, so that's my presentation. I, I hope you found it somewhat helpful, but obviously um, I'll stop sharing my screen now and uh, we can move into any questions. Yeah, Gene Morrison asks, um, how do you apply this thinking to the need for reform at the Minneapolis Police Department? Wow. <laughs> or, many, so, or, you know, or maybe policing in general, you know, how do you apply this framework? Well, I think it's, uh, we're, seeing it, we're seeing it play out now as well that the, the stakeholders involved, I think we all focus on the things that are the most immediately relevant to us and the things that are in terms of timing. Um, and so I think taking a step back and saying, how does police fit in with the overall uh, fabric of social services? How does it fit in with the budget? How does it fit in with our goals as a city? Um, it may be that uh, having police be the first responders to any number of variety of, of uh, events and crises in the city may or may not be the best use of those resources. Um, but I think, uh, I don't think any, <laughs> don't be in a hurry to make a bad decision, Minneapolis City Council. Um, I think there needs to be some process, some uh, chances for voices to be heard, and I'm, I don't know this for a fact, but I can guarantee that there's probably a lot of people who are in, in law enforcement who don't want to be categorized as being on one side or another, but understand the, the variety of, of uh, uh, not only stakeholders, but uh, impact that some of those changes could have. But once again, it's about process and reflection. I think for a lot of times we, uh, when it comes to business ethics decisions, uh, people tend to go with their gut or they tend to say, okay, I, I, I can see what the, you know, my first thought here, this is what we're going to do. I always say, you know, the number one thing to do is to take a step back and to make sure that you've done a, a, good, a good inventory of all the affected parties. It also seems like it, it, it gets more nuanced as you go through the process. Truth is one thing, but then when you get down to justice, you know, relationships benefit, it's way more nuanced and, and more information needs to be collected to get all of the sides. Absolutely, yeah, utility and rights tend to be kind of like light switches, you know, it either is the greater good or it isn't, or, you know, but justice and, and ethic of care are complicated and we are complicated. And when you're dealing with large groups of people, it, it, is, it is not helpful to say, oh, everybody in this category has exactly the same idea because I guarantee you they probably don't. So, so on, that, on that topic of, you know, truth seems to be the easiest one, but Mark, uh, I'm sorry, Mike Martin, asks, is it the truth is getting harder to come by in a media environment that tends to pick sides during reporting? How do we unpack truth from that perspective? Yeah, and that's, you know, where you're getting information, how you're uh, receiving information is, uh, is very important. And I think, you know, with my students, one of the things that I try to do is encourage them to uh, not just read headlines on Facebook and Instagram and, you know, get their media in bite-sized chunks. Um, there are some really good journalists doing amazing long-form journalism. Uh, I was impressed, quite frankly, the Wall Street Journal sent some incredible journal, you know, a South High graduate <laughs> interviewed the South High football team, you know, for the Wall Street Journal, which was pretty incredible. And um, think about those primary voices when you hear, uh, you know, instead of having somebody summarize the news for you, are you hearing the primary sources and the people saying and, and the data there as well? Um, and again, for me, it's not so much about truth because that's, it's almost impossible to ever know all the truth. 
especially with what I'm doing, it's our people, people who are intentionally hiding the truth or twisting the truth that I think is really the problem. Because if somebody is lying, it almost always is because they have an intent to get you to do something or believe something that you wouldn't believe if you really knew what was going on. And I think it's more important for us to fight falsehood than it is to beat people up because they haven't got every single detail correct. Dennis Hikes asks, can you share the typical reactions of your students as you present this valid material? That is, do you get uh, cynicism in response, confusion, skepticism? How do they react? You know, for the most part, my students, so I, I have two very different groups of students. My first year undergrads are typically quite open to, uh, you know, not as, as a, they're not cynical. Um, they think they, uh, they want to know more. Uh, I also teach in our executive MBA program, which is, you know, people who are already seasoned leaders who are coming back to do an MBA who, uh, you know, when I did the, when I talked about the McCormick pepper case, I have people who actually work in the food industry <laughs> and they're like, what's the big deal? You know, I'm like, well, <laughs> the idea here is that this is a thought process to think through. And um, so I think, but I think all the students, people, I haven't had a lot of cynicism because I think people want, to, my class is a time for people to say, okay, here's common sense. Here's some things we've been talking about, but I don't ever take this kind of time to think it through. And that's why I think these classes are valuable, not because we're giving people an answer, this is the right thing to do, but we're saying, okay, let it breathe. We have the time, we've got brilliant, you know, my students, I learn as much from my students as I do, as they do from me or more. Um, let's take the time to talk through this and negotiate, you know, think about the different sides here and um, helping people to get that process. It's like, it's like being a great shortstop, right? You can't be a great shortstop by catching, you know, two or three baseballs and throwing them to first base. It's, it's a, you got to do it over and over again. And that's one thing that a, a full 16 weeks with my first year students, especially gives them the chance to really, I think, engage in some critical thinking. And they're very open uh, to thinking about, you know, why people are making some of these decisions and how we can make better decisions. Yeah, watching that process happen is illuminating as well. We do a leadership ethics seminar in the fall with the Dinah High School students and, prov and provide them with some gray ethical dilemmas. And to watch them go through it and hear the different answers is very informative and interesting. Um, Sandra asks, can you speak to the assessment of the founding father rates according to Kohlberg. I'm not sure what that is, but maybe you, you catch that. Um, I'm not sure uh, I get that. I'm um, sorry, I didn't. Um, can you hear me? I can, yeah. yes. Okay, hi. Um, I had learned a long time ago that in Kohlberg, unfortunately, you know, has committed suicide since I studied anything about him. Uh, but he had said something about that uh, the, found, the founding fathers, if they were judged according to the, the rating that you are probably very familiar with, that they would come out very high on um, valuing the common good. Do you have any comments on that or have you looked at that? I, I do. And I, I'm thinking a little bit more about um, of another philosopher named John Rawls, who has, a, uh, uh, has an, a, several essays he's written in terms of justice as fairness. But uh, I think the idea here, yes, is that the founding fathers wanted to set up a system. Uh, the, the American legal system and the Constitution is a guide, a general guide. It's those, it's those painted lines around the basketball court that say where, you know, what's outside and what's inside, uh, as opposed to, say, a code like, you know, having a rule for every specific circumstance, that we want to have a, a living, breathing system of participatory democracy, of a justice system that allows people to, to plead their case. Um, and so it very much was uh, understanding that individual rights needed to be protected, but the cultivation of a civic understanding, this, like I said, the social fabric, social contract um, uh, was, if we were to think about having a society that can be sustainable, uh, fair and provide um, the opportunity, right, for the pursuit of happiness, um, I think absolutely is the case. And, and so I, when I talk about the social contract in my class, I put a picture of the Constitution on the, on the screen. And I say, you know, this is, you know, we're so fortunate to have this, this guide, 
right? It's not going to answer every single specific question you may have, but at least it gives us the framework to be able to achieve something so that, you know, we, every four years we have a peaceful transition of power if we have a new president or as the, you know, Congress switches from Republican to Democrat, we do it in a peaceful uh, way as opposed to having, uh, you know, what we see happening in countries where there's just not the same stability. This is actually a great segue into the last question from Paul Moody. Paul says, as a follow-up, politicians of all stripes seem interested in self only, votes and power. Since it is unlikely to ever change, how do we as a general public affect change? Well, I think it's, <laughs> it's because we can vote, right? I mean, somebody said, I think somebody asked Steve Kerr for the Golden State Warriors, how do you tell Steph Curry what to do? And he said, I can put Steph Curry on the bench. And that's why I can get Steph Curry. You know, that's how I can be a coach. And I think we have the same responsibility. And we also have to be engaged. Um, I think sitting back and waiting for other people to uh, take up the, the, the mantle of social leadership. Um, I mean, I think civic organizations, my, my dad wasn't a Rotarian. My father was a li in the Lions Club. Uh, but I grew up in uh, understanding that, you know, being involved uh, as a, in terms of civic society, we vote. We can uh, work with our communities. Uh, I think we've seen a lot just in the last two weeks with the incredible social unrest around the killing of George Floyd. Um, I know even my own neighborhood here in St. Paul, I'm about a half a mile south of uh, 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 Target Midway. And, you know, we've, we've come together. I mean, we are making sure that we are connecting. And I think, you know, voting, being active and not waiting for someone else to do it for you is, is really the best way to help help our politicians understand that they work for us and not the other way around. Rand, thank you so much for helping us to solve all of the issues of the world today. <laughs> <laughs> and for, for sharing your, your analyses and uh, a great presentation. We'd love to have you come back and do more in person sometime soon. And sorry, we couldn't offer that to you today. So thanks again for being here. You're so welcome. Thank you. Rich Kleber. Thank you, Rand. Yeah, very, very interesting and uh, some good thoughts for us to try not to be too cynical in this world and we'll use the, uh, the ethical approaches. You are JC, so uh, keep those in mind. So thank you, uh, Mr. Rand Park. Uh, Rotary is a global network of 1.2 million neighbors, friends, leaders, problem solvers who see the world where people unite and take action to create lasting change. From literacy and peace to water and health, we are always working to better our world, and we stay connected to the end and committed to the end. In honor of your presentation today, we will make a donation to Rotary's official disaster relief partner, Shelter Box, which provides emergency shelter to families devastated by natural disasters and conflict around the world. Thank you again. Thanks, Rand. Thanks, Rich. Okay, here's what's coming up. Next week, John Kaufman will be here from California to present on his nonprofit, H2 Open Doors, which uh, just completed a uh, water purifying project at our partner, the Esquintla National Hospital in Guatemala. And on that call next week, Drs. Posadas and Menendez, who are, were our guests in the fall, with the president of the Rotary Club of Esquintla, you see here, Rolando Morales, will be on the Zoom call as well. Don't miss that. Uh, we'll have uh, John on the call for questions. We'll also have a great uh, recorded interview back and forth uh, with some great material on what he does. Then uh, that same Thursday, we've got the Wines of Summer Wine Tasting. Registration has gone out already to the membership on that. And then the next week, it's the transition meeting as we uh, hand over the pins and the rain to President-elect Sam Thompson. After that meeting takes place from 1.30 to 3 p.m., we will have a drive-up parade at my house. You see the address here. Come on by, honk your horn, pull in the driveway, get out, give him a bump, do whatever you can do to uh, let Sam know we're, how excited we are for his year's president. Our closing quote today comes from Warren Buffett, American investor, business tycoon, and philanthropist, who is the chairman and CEO of Berkshire Hathaway. 
He is considered one of the most successful investors in the world and has a net worth of $89 billion, making him the fourth wealthiest person in the world. Buffett is noted for his adherence to value investing and for his personal frugality, despite his immense wealth. And on the topic of ethics, Warren says, it takes 20 years to build a reputation and five minutes to ruin it. If you think about that, you do things differently. I see you, Rand, right? Think in the long term and go through the ethical evaluation process to get to the right result. As you go about your week, remember that together we see a world where people unite and take action to create lasting change across the globe, in our communities, and in ourselves as Rotary pursues its mission to connect the world in meaningful ways. Everyone be safe and be well and have a great week. Meeting adjourned. Thanks everyone. Thanks everybody. Have a great, great rest meeting. of the week. Thanks Rand. Bye-bye. Bye. Goodbye all. Good to see you, Chuck. Bye all. And great there. meeting as always. Thank you. Thanks, Sandra. Good to see you. Good to see you, Doug. You, you figured it out. Good to see you, Doc. Yeah, we got twin granddaughters yesterday. All right. Reverse mentoring. I love it.